as we speak. I pray, Lord, that you'll give and, 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 and open the minds and the understanding of the, those who are listening, whether those who are here uh, with us or those that are online. I pray, Lord, that you will uh, give above and beyond what mortal man could ever give. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Why should we grow on foods? We're on the same subject. However, I just want to just put a few things out here I think is important. And um, as you see here on the screen, this is a chart that's just showing you the, um, as we look at the different types of minerals on this far end here, and it shows you the progression of time um, as we've gone from the 1900s to 1910, 1920, 1930, between 1920 and 1930, there was some, uh, some things taking place. And if you notice, things like phosphorus, um, copper, uh, cobalt, iron, different minerals, they started to fall off the chart. And as they fell off the chart, fall off the chart, we find that when did it start to fall off the chart was when mechanical farming, farming started to take place. Using the heavy equipment to till up the soil, the, the mineral composition of the earth started to decrease. Uh, because of the, the different farming techniques and the, 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 that was being utilized, we know for hundreds of years, people have been farming, uh, utilizing shovels, hoes, things of that nature. And when they started getting into the mechanical farming, this is when the problem started. And it caused the different minerals to be leached out of the soil from the rain, the wind. It started to lose the mineral composition in the earth. And so as a result of that, we start seeing a decrease in the mineral composition of the earth and it fell dramatically up until the, not, about the 1950s. It dramatically fell off. Huge, can y'all see that? A huge decrease. And, uh, and it's something that we really need to take note. Heavy mechanical farming is not the way to go because it destroys the soil. The, the soil. And had God, matter of fact, in the Garden of Eden, when God cursed the earth because of Adam's sin, the Bible tells us that the earth will not give forth its what? Its strength. And God, looking down to the time when you and I are here, he saw that our bodies would not be able to handle all that strength, the energy, the minerals, the composition of the earth. And so he cursed the earth because it's the last generation that is going to vindicate his name. And we have to have a mindset to be able to do these things. And so over time, we had ammonium nitrate that was then put into the soil because of, I think it's World War, what, one or two? I forgot which one it was. Um, but anyhow, as a result of the ammunition being produced, uh, we have ammonium nitrate that was a byproduct of it. And the rock, well, the high wealthy families of the world, they sold off that waste to the farmers and put it in the soil and it caused a continued decrease of the mineral composition. And then when we get over to the, um, the Rodell Group, are y'all familiar with the Rodell Group? Uh, any of y'all familiar with um, testing of soil? You ever heard of testing of soil to find out the minerals? The NPK that you find on the back of different uh, uh, soil amendments, you may have a three digit number like triple 13, 603 or something of that nature. Anyhow, that has come about from the Rodale's group. And as a result of that, um, the testing, sodium nitrate, potassium, those are four things that are three things rather that are, that are put in the soil today. It does not make up for all of the minerals. This is just a few, of course. It does not make up for all of the minerals, the 66 different minerals that God has put into this earth. And so that's caused even more damage to the soil. And even though we use these different chemicals, or, or, or man-made co or combined different uh, minerals to feed the plants is doing even worse degradation to the soil. And the nutrients are truly dropping to the point to where there's what? Down here by 2010, you're hardly reading anything. There's hardly anything found in the soil. And at the same time, with the drop of minerals in the soil, in the earth, what has happened directly in relation to that as, an, as the mineral composition in the soil has gone down, there's been a rise in disease. So the lower the mineral composition in the earth falls, the higher disease is on the rise. And then, of course, when it got to the point 
um, from the pesticides, uh, fungicides, and the herbicides, they decrease these more. And then also from the GMO and the uh, glycophosphates that's in pencil soil, it's just cancer and these other things are just off the charts. And so we find that in the soil is depleted of minerals. What are we made up of? Where do we come from? So if the earth is depleted, and, and that means we're depleted, right? And also, did you know that the earth has gotten into the neoplastic disease uh, stage? You know what neoplasm is? Neoplasm is a stage where cancer is developed and cancer is, is moving forward. And so in the soil, in the earth, the earth has become cancerous. And we can see it, the disease is neoplastic or the neoplasm stage. And that's where we see people having cancer and uh, where the, the body's literally breaking down. And when we look at the earth, we can see that the earth is literally breaking down. We see literally around the world, holes are falling through the earth. Why? Because the earth is diseased. And then I want to also share, right, sinks. And I also want to share that, um, there's a closer picture there. You see all these diseases down here, all these are just symptoms of what's happened here. And um, the nutritional value of food is also, is, of course, has changed. Uh, back in 1950, there was approximately 4.3 milligrams of iron. We go to 1998, it takes, what is this, 26 apples to equal the iron in one apple. Can we eat 26 apples in one setting? No. It's obviously not. So there's a serious problem. And we're just getting worse and worse and worse when it comes to disease. All right. So we have to do something about it because we cannot look to the industry because what's, what's happening in the industry? What's happening in the industry? There's nothing out there. So we have to do something about it. Again, because God has seen that uh, there needs to be a, a change for us. However, we at the end of time, we have to move into a different arena. And God has told us already that we need to grow our own foods, we need to get into the country, start producing our own foods and uh, uh, things that we need for life, health, and strength. So it's important that we go back to the earth, all right? And um, I just want to just pull out this right here real quickly. This is a BRICS chart, BRICS, B-R-I-X. And what this is uh, dealing with is referring to the sugar content of foods. And so it's important to recognize that uh, have you ever eaten an orange and it tastes like water? Yeah. Uh, an orange and it tastes like water. Yeah. Have you eaten a plum that has no taste? No. And the reason that that happens is because I mentioned about it the, uh, yesterday. There's a particular, y'all, you heard me, a particular amendment that is sold everywhere that everybody puts in their garden to get nice, big, fat food. There you go. It's high in what? And of course, the plants get it out of the air. So the plants really don't need it. It gets it out of the air. And because of it, it causes the fruit to get nice and big and fat and fluffy. And of course, when we look at the sugar reading, the bricks measure sugar. That's all it's for. It's for measuring the amount of sugar in the food. So, uh, and, and that's the same thing that we use to look at the body, the sugar in the body, no different, right? So, because the, the, the fruit is the fruit of the earth, we are the fruit of the earth too, right? To our parents, so anyhow, let's get back to it. So we look at the sugar reading. So when we, let's look at uh, apples, for instance. Apples should have a rating of 10, but again, because the earth was cursed, actually it should be higher. The sugar content of the apple has dropped. Because where, what is the units of existence? I have energy. What are the units? And I have a chart I saw over here, so I'm going to pull it. And I think the Lord made me see it so I can show you now. The periodical chart. That has all of the elements known to man. All the elements that were supposed to be in the crust of the earth. And so when the foods are made up of the different minerals that it has, it would have an excellent reading, right? So when we look at this, um, 
that mineral. You can't see it here, but it has an atomic number, right? And other different characteristics that we find in these different elements. And it shows us the amount of energy that's in these different uh, uh, minerals, right? Based upon the combination and its makeup, it will determine the strength of whatever that thing is, right? Just like our bones are supposed to be hard, right? But in some cases, it does what it just breaks very easily because the mineral composition is not there. The energy, the strength is not there. And that's why if I have an apple, sometimes you can put the apple on the counter, come back the next day and it's rotten. Strawberry, that's probably a better example. A new shipment of strawberries comes to the store, and if you don't get it the first day, you're going to see strawberries missing out of the packages. Have y'all noticed that? Why is that? They take out the rotten ones. So as soon as they get into the store, they're, they're rotten. Rotten. Sugar is a what? Preserver. So if the sugar reading is high in these foods, that means the foods are what? They won't rot so fast. Because sugar is a what? So you want to have food that has high? Because when we measure the sugar, it's telling us the amount of mineral we have in the food. Right? So if you have an apple here, another apple, same size, one is whoop, a little heavier, means it has more minerals. It's going to be sweeter. All right? Let's move forward. All right. Done with this one. So I just wanted to show you all that. This is where we really want to go. So, boom. Gardening 102. The reason why it's 102 is because we're working on a series. So this is the second element on what to plant. We want to know what we need to plant. Why is this important? Because if you don't understand that there are, for instance, there are, let's take a tomato, for instance. We all like tomatoes, right? OK. Let's take something else. How about potatoes? You potatoes? Yeah. All right. The different types of potatoes, and they grow differently. Peppers, different type of peppers, differently. All right. And so we want to look at these things to understand what are some of the differences on these plants, and whether you need to grow them or not, based upon your garden, how big or how small your garden is, will really determine the things that you want to plant. And so this is important because you want to get the maximum out of the food that you're growing, right? You want to be able to get the maximum out of the space that you're utilizing, right? And so this is what we want to look at so that we can get a better understanding of, of, of making, making better uh, uh, informed choices when we start looking at planting foods because this is important. And why is it important to grow own foods? Because if you get foods, grow foods in your own backyard, you know it's going in the ground, one. You're not going to pick it and leave it in the, in the refrigerator for three months before you eat it, right? No. You pick it when you need it, right? So if it's sitting on the vine for three, four weeks, what's happening? More and more sugars are going into that food, and the sweeter it gets. That's right. And so that's why you find that homegrown foods are always what? Sweeter. Better tasting. The whole nine yards, right? And then the other reason why you want to, to uh, garden is because we're all told that there's going to be what? A time of fasting or a time of what? Famine. So we need to prepare for ourselves. And then your president has already told you what? There's going to be a food. He's your president, not mine. He's your president. He said that, Mr. Biden. He don't call you me, though. <laughs> my president is the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. Now. He's my president. And he's told me there's going to be a famine. He's told me in his word. Matter of fact, he wrote me a love letter. Come on now. And told me, plant a garden. Matter of fact, you know what? He, he told me, do what I have done. And if you do what I've done, I'm going to take care of you. So when we look at the very beginning of time, what did he do? He planted a garden and he put Adam and Eve in. Right? And so we want to follow the very course that he has guided us on. And so this is why we want to look at what we want to plant, things we need to plant, okay? So the first thing, of course, we need to do, we have to choose our what? Our seeds. 
And it's important, uh, we're not getting into this part here, but it's important that we learn how to preserve our seeds, right? So when you're growing foods, you may have three or four different types of tomatoes growing. There's certain things you need to put in place so we, that way you can save your seed and have a pure seed. And I think we're going to talk about the type of seeds. I think we have a little, just a couple of uh, slides on that we'll just touch on, okay? So it's important to choose the type of seeds. So here again, so we're going to start with fresh quality seeds. We want to, as best as possible, we want to have good seed. Seeds will last for a little while, but in some cases, they will not last long. Some seeds will last one year. And if you don't, if you're not keeping up with it, you'll lose that particular type of food, right? Seeds should be stored in dark, dry, cool place. Very important, right? And, and sometimes some seeds have to be stratified. And uh, so being able to, keeping it in the fridge, which in a cool area, would be very good and helpful for that process. You want to make sure to read the back of your seed packets, where you get it from, learn about how you need to plant your seeds. Some seeds need to go a certain depth. You know, some, matter of fact, um, uh, if, if, if time lasts, we have enough, enough time, I'll show you this, a little small clip. And so you can get a little, uh, 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 a little understanding of what we call seed blocks. You ever heard of seed blocks? Yeah. Any, anybody else? It's a, a seed blocks. It's a, it's a, a blocking. It's a, it's a means of being able to plant uh, uh, seeds, start to seeds, and have 100% growth rate out of your garden. So you can, ahead of time, you can know what's going on and you can um, correct problems before, so that you don't have seeds not germinating in your garden. And it's a way of planting and being to sow your seeds and have a good production. All right, let's move. Um, consider the germination rates of your plants, how long it takes to germinate, uh, blah, 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 all that information you find on the back of your seed packets. This right, this chart right here, just a chart showing uh, when you would plant different seeds. Of course, you're not going to be planting these things outside. You're planting them inside, starting seed blocking is a good method again to start your seeds um, so that as soon as the, the, the weather breaks, what I mean by that is when you have your last frost date for the year, you can start planting your garden, take your seeds and plants outside and get them in the ground right away. That way you can start this, the, the production uh, of your garden process very you know, early. And that way you can get two years of food production every summer or every uh, uh, growing season. Okay, typically we get one planting season, you can get two planting seasons. And, that, and you're starting your season anywhere from six to eight to 10 weeks before it's ready to go outside. So by the time it goes outside, um, your plants are already established. You don't have to wait for them to germinate. And if you use the seed blocking uh, method that, um, that we refer to, the moment you put it in the ground, those roots will start taking off and you'll get root growth the very negative that you put them out. It's very, very great. And it's superior to any other form of preparation of seeds. Instead of using the little plastic containers, or what have you, you can get them going right away. Plants are healthy. You have no plant shock, none of that stuff. And you have a good uh, process. So that's good to use that. And that's just an example of some things. And of course, all your seeds, you want to look at them and, um, and you want to determine based upon germination rate and all that type of thing when you actually start your season of planting. And this is a good, you know, snapshot of when to get started. Herbs 101. We just want to quickly look at a few things on herbs, dealing with herbs. Um, of course, there's different varieties of herbs you can use. Um, and some of these herbs that you use in the kitchen, you can also use, we're going to touch on this when we start looking at um, combinations or combining or combination planting or companion planting, whatever term you want to use. And some of these um, different herbs can actually help you to ward off different diseases and different bugs. So you can limit the amount of, uh, of problems you have. The best time to plant a seed for an herb depends on the cold tolerance of that herb. Again, that's why you want to read the packets and see when do you plant them, right? Um, look at the rule. What does it say? Everybody, let's read this rule together. So hardy perennials, herbs when? Outdoors, several weeks 
When? Before the? All right. Why is that? So in the, oh, oh, I didn't, let me explain this real quick. We, the Bible says that God, that we are but a what? A vapor. What's vapor? It's energy. It's energy. So energy, we know, back to the periodical chart, all these elements deal with what? The flow of energy, right? And so when we start looking at the earth, we have the same thing taking place in the earth. And there's many different minerals that we will put in the earth um, that we want to make sure is in the earth in the proper um, or average uh, quantities that should be because the minerals, particularly calcium, and this, this is, you know, it's so striking when you look at the human body and you look at the earth, they, they run side by side. Why? Because we come from the earth. Calcium is the most important mineral in the human body by weight and volume more than any other mineral. Same thing with the earth. It must have calcium. It's the highest, it's important mineral in the earth. Why? Because it controls the flow of electricity. Very important. Calcium. Calcium. We have what we call an anionic calcium, which is a calcium that upward. And we have a cationic calcium, which is a calcium that energy moves in a downward direction. Spiral down and spirals up. So when you have a seed and the seed germinates, which way do the roots go? They go down. You know why they go down? Because the roots, by nature, are, are, are cationic. So they move in a downward energy. It, energy drives them down. And the leaves grow which direction? Upward. Because of the energy, the anionic energy moves in a upward direction. All right? You turn the seed over, the roots will go back down, and the, root, and the uh, leaves will go back up, right? So when we look at calcium, and there's two types of calciums, basic categories. And uh, so at the beginning of the year, anionic energy in the earth is stimulated. And your plants do what? They grow. And at a certain time, there's a switch in the earth. And it's based upon those calciums. And then the energy now, instead of flowing upward, it's now moving the plants to, to go downward. And this is where you have the dropping or the production of your foods. Apples, oranges, which way do they, do they grow up? Do they grow up? It comes down. That's because of the energy change based upon your calcium. And if you don't believe me, I can give you a, a name of a type of calcium that's anionic. And you can flood your garden with anionic energy. And guess what will happen to your, 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 your corn? The stalks will grow and 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 grow. And you have no food, no corn on the cob. And God designed this way, right? So every mineral has its place in your body and in the earth. So that's important, all right? So your, uh, your perennials, they, they, you want to plant them before the frost so that when the energy starts to flow for the growth process, what happens? Those seeds can do what? Start right away. The annual herbs, they germinate better in what? Warm soil. So these you want to start where? inside the house, get them going. So then when, it, when, the, when the weather breaks and there's a change in the cold spring, then we wanna get ahead and get those plants out there and that way it has the warmth to grow, okay? Transplanting, once the danger of frost is gone, you can go ahead and plant them outside. Uh, Would that be like a rosemary, lavender, rosemary? Your rosemary is hardy. All of your, 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 what's what I'm looking for? They become fibrous and woody. Yes, they're very, very hardy. And, and of course, there are others too. But, um, and, and you, you know, you could also look at um, 
the I'm not going to go there. But anyhow, you, we can go and look at and see the different ones that are, which are uh, grow once a year and which will continue year after year. So when we start looking at fertilizers, we have organic fertilizer decompose slowly. And then, of course, you have time release. And it's better to use your organic fertilizers, of course. And um, uh, there was something I wanted to say about that. I can't remember at the time. But, but oh, yeah, yes, yes. You can feed, and you want to feed your, your plants, and you can feed them you know, weekly, weekly, or, and you can make your own fertilizers from different teas and different things you can utilize. There's a few that I recommend, not a whole lot, but a few that you can feed your plants and be able to have very good production, um, have high energy, high sugar, high salt, um, mineral foods, so that you can have um, good production. Okay, let's move on. Um, so herbs. You can pinch your herbs as they grow. You pinch off the tops of your herbs, and they'll start growing forks. Right? You can have you create a bushy plant by pinching them. And the reason being is because um, when you pinch off the tops, then it's going to stimulate a particular hormone that says, hey, we need to get more production here so you have two and three branching taking place. All right? And so that will help to give you a nice bushy plant. All right? Um, spring pruning. Of course, you want to go through each year, you want to prune your plants. And the purpose of pruning, just in a nutshell, pruning after the winter stimulates the plant to grow. All right? So anytime you, you prune in the winter and spring, it's going to cause that tree to say, hey, somebody cut my arm off. We need to replace it quickly, and a tree will grow or a bush will grow. In the summertime, when you prune plants, it doesn't operate that way. It says, whoa, slow down. They're trying to stop us from growing so fast. So if you prune your plant in the winter, summer, in the winter summertime, it's going to what? Stunt the growth. You prune in the wintertime, springtime is going to do what? Cause the plant to grow. Keep that in mind. All right. Um, also, when we start looking at uh, propagating plants, uh, dividing them, getting more plants. You have some that will spread and some will clump, right? So uh, some spread through runners, rather. So like strawberries, they shoot out runners, right? The runner goes to and stops another and go on. And then you have some that will clump, like in um, onions and other types of uh, 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 rhizome, like your ginger and others, they clump. You can divide them and you can propagate them that way. Also, you can do the same thing with uh, cuttings from your woody plants, rosemary, and uh, you can you know, do some uh, uh, root them and, and you can start other plants. Same thing with the less woody type cuttings and you can start propagate them as well. So that's that. Let's look at legumes. The two types of legumes. You have legumes that are what? Bush. So bush and pole. They're two different types of, of plants, right? Bush beans may not be the proper one for your garden, right? Same thing with pole beans. Let's look at, at the differences and why. Bush beans and pole beans grow very differently, but they also share some things that have some things in common, right? Bush. Uh, beans, rather, are classified by their growth habit into two major categories. Bush beans, which are dwarf, and they bush out. And then you have the pole beans that do what? Right? So pole uh, grow as tiny, twining climbers, usually 10 to 16 feet tall. And what was that? We're going to get into that now. We have all sorts of types of beans that fall into these categories, one of these two categories. So those types will grow up like, uh, like uh, there's a fairy tale talks about the beanstalk. And I'll touch that. But anyhow, uh, so those that grow, uh, they require trellis of some sort, you, you know, bamboo, sticks, whatever. It doesn't matter. Anything that will allow it to climb. This is a what? What type of bean plant is this? This would be a bush. All right, and so there's differences between the two. So when you start looking at the pole beans, 
the, the pole beans need more time, time than bush beans to produce. The, so the pole beans would have more time to climb and climb and grow, right? Whereas the bush beans, they don't grow to about two feet. And they'll put out different amounts. Uh, the yield, uh, one yields more beans than the other and requires a longer time and is more disease resistant. What are we talking about? The pole beans. They produce more, take a longer time to grow, and they're more disease resistant. So let's look at some of the common uh, or some of the, some of the differences here with the bush beans. All right, bush beans. They grow. They're short and bushy, right? Obviously, some of the plants. The question you asked a little while ago. You have the black lake bush. Different ones here. You can see the um, royal burgundy, the Kentucky wonder. Uh, Blue Lake, different types, all kinds of different uh, of, of, of beans, and numbers of them, all right? They grow approximately two feet tall, reaching between about 24 inches, 24 inches, one or two feet, and they're typically planted very close together in the garden, all right? And the reason being because they don't get that high. So if you have a small garden, you probably will not want to put these down. Well, you might. Because they, they, they grow very small, maybe two feet high, two feet wide, right? And, um, and they're typically planted very close together. Um, they don't require any support system. They grow short and, um, and they produce. Also, uh, they mature very fast. They're ready to harvest between 40 and 60 days. They produce all at once within a two week span or so, right? All they produce a uh, relatively short time period, usually within one or two weeks. And they're very susceptible to what? A wide variety of diseases. Why? Because they're close together, lower to the ground. All right? But again, if you don't have, if you don't have a lot of room, you know, typically they're planted close together. You know, you take your choice. So here are some different ones, black beans, different ones. Just a handful of them. Pole beans. Pole beans are also known as runners. Um, they grow tall. They climb, or known as climbing beans. And again, some of the common names. You heard, we, we mentioned the Kentucky Wonder. Remember? Mentioned that? You can get them in both. Uh, but there's many different ones. Heirlooms, different types of plants, beans. There are tons of them. They grow anywhere from 12 to 16 feet tall. You realize that? They, grow, they can grow tall. Some very tall. Um, uh, pole beans are large and impressive plants. Um, pole beans need, uh, they won't, uh, uh, they don't do well in compact areas. And they need pruning to, if you want to keep control of the height, right? And, um, and also, they, okay, so they control their growth. Also, um, you need a good support system to put them on, uh, a trellis, a fence, TP, whatever, corn stalks, corn stalks, corn stalks, hint, hint, corn stalks. Did y'all catch that hint? Yeah. All right. So you can grow them. And, you know, I think, okay, let's move on. Also, pole beans that have a longer production time, so they grow a long, over a long period of time, you can pick them. They allow you the opportunity to grow the beans, pick the beans and use them all summer long. Opposed to the bush beans, which produce how many times? Once. And then you can pull them up, you can plant another batch of them or a different batch of them, or maybe somewhere else and grow something else. Right, so anytime you start dealing with beans or peas, they will produce all summer long. Okay, and or you can just let them stay and dry, however you want. Also, um, they are hardier. They are less susceptible to different diseases. And they dry faster after rains. Why? Because they're airy. Air can go through them. They dry faster. And they have better air circulation. So they're less susceptible to diseases than your 
your bushy plants. So they, they're all different types of beans and you can choose and pick the types that you want. So based upon your, based upon your, the, the type of garden you're growing and the space that you have, you can determine which is better for you because what's better for you may not be better for somebody else, right? Something you want may not be what somebody else wants. So all these things are done for what you want. Here we got some runners and some different examples. And even to the point you have some that are foot long string beans. You all familiar with those? Oh, yeah. So you can grow them on long, on a long trellis and you can have them produce quite a bit. Again, you can pick them or you can let them dry. Quick, 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 yes, what do you? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Let's look at some differences. Quickly, the biggest difference is their what? It's their growing style. That's the biggest difference. One grows up, one grows out. All right. Um, we're not going to, some of the few things different, but we're going to go past that. They all need what? They all need sun. They all need warmth at least six or eight hours. And uh, they also use nitrogen, but we want to get it from where? The air. And also delicious crops. Everybody enjoys them. Enough of that. Let's move on to another area. Garlic. Garlic. I know some people don't like garlic. Some people love garlic. But garlic have different types of garlic. There's a soft neck and the hard neck. You know the difference? Let's look at the difference. Uh, they're related to onions, leeks, and chives. Uh, besides uh, seasoning, they're used for many different things, for healing and all kinds of stuff. Garlic is divided into two different groups. Which one is best for you? Let's look. Um, soft neck produces small, tight, packed bulbs with what? Many cloves, from 12 to 20 different cloves, right? The bulbs are bigger with smaller Cloves. How many times you go into the store and get cloves? You get garlic, and these are small. And other times, these are big. It's the type of garlic that it is, right? So, um, also we find that the soft necks, they're the type that people braid because the neck stays soft. So they they braid them and um, and keep them for harvest. Uh, commonly sold in super. Parks, supermarket rather, and they last from what? Six to nine months. All right. Soft necks are less tolerant of prolonged cold temperature than the hard neck. All right. Let's move on. The hard neck garlic is extremely what? Cold hardy. Some garlics you can leave in the ground, and some garlic you don't want to store in the ground. All right, so this type of garlic produces flavorful bulbs with four to 14 cloves. The bulbs are small, but the cloves are large. Also, we find that the hard neck produce a flower stalk or scape, which is uh, the head where you have little uh, bulblets coming up. And so for those, the bulblets should be what cut off of the plant so the energy, instead of going into those small bublets, it can go now down into the garlic itself and produce big gar gar cloves, All right? You don't want to wait until it opens up. As soon as you see it manifest, cut it off, All right? The same with the energy in the earth. It can go up or it can go down. And so what you're doing here, you remember when, uh, when Joseph was uh, working for his, his uncle Laban? And his uncle wanted to uh, deceive him and get him to work for nothing. Well, guess what? He made it his business to learn the science of cattle. And as a result, he was able to take that information and manipulate it and produce whatever he wanted. And this is a way that you can do the same thing. So by cutting off the bulblets, there's no more direction for the NG to go. So it goes where? back into the ball. And this is why, 
this is why you, well, that's a different direction. Okay, storage for hard neck lasts until what? Midwinter. They have a longer storage shelf, right? Okay, so what garlic should you plant? Which garlic should you plant? It depends on what? Why? What you want. Like everything else. What are your needs? What are you wanting to do? You can make informed decisions, right? Okay, let's look at tomatoes. Determine what type of tomato is right for your garden, right? So choosing what type of tomato to grow in your garden may seem easy as checking them out at your local grocery store. But knowing a little bit more about these, the right type of tomato and how they grow in your garden will give you some definite rewards. There are two types of or classifications of tomatoes. There's a determinate and an indeterminate. Which one is best for you? The two main types of tomatoes grown are those, the determinate and indeterminate. The determinate varieties bear their entire crop all at one time. And it makes sense if you want to preserve foods. So if you want to preserve tomatoes, like making sauce or uh, 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 um, salsa. How do you know that's what I was trying to think of? <laughs> you must like salsa too, huh? Or tomato paste, any of those things, this is the right type of tomato to use. Because, well, as far as the tomato part, so, so, so you want to use a determinate type of tomato because a determinate, determined tomato produces tomatoes at what? All in one time. So you can get the whole batch and do all your preparations, bam, at that time, and you're done. All right? And of course, these types of um, plants, um, the Indian term varieties, uh, have, have fruit ripening over an extended season. So that's a different type. With determined, it's all at one point, right? Um, also, determined are usually bush tomatoes, just like your beans, your bush beans. They're bushy, right? They don't grow high because the energy stays at a good production. And so the time frame is predetermined. The size is predetermined, and they produce at a quicker rate. They set flowers very early, and it, at the end of the termination of those branches, the stems where they grow, and they ripen very early all at once, ideally again for canning, saucing, freezing, whatever it is you're going to do. You have another comment you want to make? Okay. Uh, due to their compact size and abundant fruit produ uh, production, determinant tomatoes are great for what? Small containers, uh, for small spaces. If you have, uh, let's say, flower beds, you can put them in those small spaces and they'll produce quite a bit of fruit, right? And it's important to know that once they produce their fruit, they're done. They're not gonna produce anymore. Pull them out of the ground and keep going. Do something else, put something else in its place, all right? And many determined varieties do not need to be staked, caged. They don't require any type of, um, of uh, maintenance. They grow short and do their thing, OK? And these are different examples. There's a, they have the, um, that's a bee steak type of plant, uh, a tomato. And uh, this is a um, uh, <laughs> man, man -toba, man Manitoba, so this one here. And of course, everybody knows this one, the Roma. So these are different types of the determinant type tomato. Sorry. No, that's a child. That's a child. Indeterminate. Indeterminate um, are vine tomatoes. Vine tomatoes. They continue to grow all season long right up until frost, right? So opposed to the bushy, produce all at once, they grow and grow and grow and grow. They do require a, a trellis and it do require pruning as well. That we can keep things moving in the same direction 
and it can continue to produce fruit all year long. The indeterminate. And if you have a, if you have a, go ahead. And with the indeterminate soil, can we also make all the stuff that we were talking about? You can do anything you want. Oh. In, in both varieties or types, you can have the different types of tomatoes or categories of tomatoes in both types. It doesn't matter. So, so, so God is so wonderful. Based upon our circumstance, everyone is adapt is it can be adaptable. No difference in the time frame. Well, again, one produces faster at uh, one time, and the other produces over a longer period of time. So you want to produce or grow what's right for you, or based upon your circumstance. So regardless, no one is left out. You see that? No one is left out. But this way you can plan what you want to do. Even when it comes to the to the determinant, if you plan at the beginning of the year, so many days later, or beginning of spring, so many days later, 40, 50 days later, boom, harvest. So you say, oh, if I plan it this time, I won't have, I'll be still working on my job. I won't have vacation. So maybe I'll plan it four weeks later. You got that? And you know when that production is going to come, just like going to the hospital and having a what kind of baby? When the baby is predetermined to come, what do we call that? Circumcision. Not circumcision. <laughs> the doctor says, hey, I'm taking a vacation on this type of day. So we can have that baby at a certain time. What do you call that? They're going to cut that baby out. A C-section. This is a C-section in type. You determine when you're going to have a harvest. You got that? Does that make sense? You can control when you're going to have your harvest. OK? And you turn it, did I miss something? OK, so they require a, a support system, right? And, um, and also, they can be uh, planted in raised beds. Flowers continue to grow along the stems all summer. You're pinching off the, the suckers so that you're controlling it. There's some maintenance involved, maintaining the growth. And that plant can. Bonita can grow 20 feet long. And if you, uh, this one won't say, if you plant it in a greenhouse, you can grow in season. And depending on the type of greenhouse you have, if you can keep it all winter long, guess what? It's going to produce fruits, tomatoes, all winter long, indeterminate, and go into the next year. And produce tomatoes the next year. But not with determined. Not with the determined. The is what? Predetermined. So they grow short, bushy, and produce all their fruit at and do something else. So they have done their job. Now something else to fill this spot. Again. Again, based upon what your situation is. So you can have tomatoes. If you have enough room and enough patience and, and to deal with it, you can have one plate, tomato plant can grow five, six years wow. and continue to grow as long as you can maintain. Of course, the trunks get long, 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 and so continue to grow, 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 grow. So you just have to control it, wow. right? But they will grow until, remember, death was never designed in the Garden of Eden. That's right. OK, what else? I have a few here. Now, there's five subcategories of tomatoes. There's two categories, right? Two types of, uh, of tomatoes, the determined and indeterminate. And in both of them, we have five subcategories. The subcategories are 
your beef type tomatoes, which you saw the little girl holding it, right? And the beef, the beef, uh, the beef steak type tomatoes are big, beefy, juicy, what we call slicing tomatoes, right? They're the meaty ones, the ones you put on the sandwiches, right? Um, they, they can, you can cook them, you can preserve them, do anything you want. They make nice thick uh, 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 so, uh, sauces, then they what? They cook down quickly, all right? Then you have the salad tomatoes. These types of tomatoes hold together well. They're perfect for what? Cutting into large chunks. They're juicy tomatoes. They longer to cook because they're so full of water, right? So the beef steak type are will cook down faster. The third category is your plum paste sauce tomato. And this is a category of your Roma tomato, right? These egg to plum shaped varieties are tasty in salads, but at their best when used for cooking and preserving. They hold their shape well when canned or sliced, and they what? They break down quickly to a rich sauce when cooked. That's why you find that most sauces are made from Roma type tomato. Right? And then in some varieties, um, like the Amish, Roma, and a few others, they are drier, so they cook down faster. They don't have as much water. They're not as watery, right? And then, of course, they've got the cherry grape type, pear type tomatoes. The name implies they're very small in size. Pop them in your mouth and you mix them to salads. They excellent roasting, like the, people dry them, right? So you can dry them and put them in soups and things of that nature. And then the last category is your heirloom type tomatoes. These are full of flavor. They're very interesting shapes and colors and sizes. And they're grown from non-hybrid seeds. And they're passed down from generation to generation. And in order to be categorized as an heirloom, it must be in existence and have been passed down for at least 50 years to qualify to be an heirloom. Okay, so when we look at the indeterminate tomatoes, um, these are just different names of them, different types, the beef steak, better boy, different types. And then we have the semi-determinate tomatoes, which is like a mix between the two, the best of bo both worlds, um, the semi-determinate. So uh, they grow like determinate tomatoes. They're very compact growth, but they produce their fruit like indeterminate, so it's continual all season long. So here's some examples of indeterminate tomatoes. Uh, the cherry type tomatoes include, boom, all these here. The examples of them, some black tomatoes, and some can get actually jet, 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 jet black as well. These are the, here's some examples of the sweet uh, million tomatoes. They're very tiny ones. And the Juliet's is right here. And of course, you have the cherry tomatoes and you have the grape tomatoes. The grape tomatoes are smaller, right? And of course, those are long. They're small and long. But anyhow, many different types. Now, let's look at this right here. This is important to understand. This is going to catch a lot of people off guard, and this is going to really hurt a lot of people. This is something you really need to understand. And I think I should have had my other slide before this one. That's OK. Let's go to the other slide first. Right there. Boom. Seed types. What does this mean? You hear of heirloom seeds? You hear of open pollinated seeds? And I don't know if you ever heard of F1, F2, and F3 seeds. There's differences between these three. I already told you what an heirloom seed is. An heirloom seed must be in existence and have been passed down for at least how many years? 15. To qualify as an heirloom seed, all right? Of course, it means it has to be what? Documented, preserved, and handed down. The open pollinated seed is just that. It's open. That means any tomato can pollinate that seed. That's what it means, right? And so it's important that we also protect our open pollinated seed um, so that we can continue to have them to go down and be able to reproduce. So if it's a closed pollinated seed, a closed pollinated seed means it cannot be. Yeah, that's okay. So a closed pollinated seed means that it cannot be pollinated by another seed. Closed. All right, 
and and so the heirloom seed will what reproduce the pollinator will reproduce now an f1 an f1 seed you can go places and you can go to many many different food companies and you'll see come and you'll start seeing f1 f1 means that it's come from a p seed and you and you hear that term only around here which means it's parent I'm talking about his parent what his parent is right and so you have two parent seeds they come together and they can produce an f1 seed an f1 seed will not regrow or be able to pass on to other generations so f1 seed if you buy f1 seed as nice tasting or beautiful as whatever plant it is those seeds will not regrow last generation so so f1 means that it's come from two parents but it's, it's a terminated seed have you all heard the term terminated seeds terminated seeds just that they they that's it once that that seed is done it's grown that's it so f1 f2 and f3 so he's going out to the twos and the threes it's showing you the generation generation and um it's second generation third generation but those seeds will not will not will not repollinate will not grow again so it's important to understand that you never want to buy an f1 f2 or f3 c no s right you want s in school no no you want no s in your garden because f represents what failure does it not so we don't want failure in the garden failure in the garden means what success at the mark of the beast that's what it means all right good deal all right so when you start looking at the different trellises the different type of trellises that we're familiar with we're familiar with this type right here another one here another one here doesn't really matter they're all trellises and they will support your tomatoes here are other types of trellises that can be utilized matter of fact I the tomatoes right there right see the red ones there tomatoes and they grow up the trellis right doesn't matter any kind of trellis has some support they'll grow and some have happened on, in, in, in so in the in the uh in the greenhouse they'll actually have on a string and then they let that tomato plant wrap up that string and climb and climb and climb and just produce tomatoes 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 as long as they keep it of course you have to prune it it'll continue to grow in one direction and it'll produce heavy tomatoes all right so tips for growing all tomatoes regardless of type need what lots of sun right y'all can read too they say they have they like to have what warm moist feet so provide constant watering what is the feet of a tomato plant the roots as they are heavy feeders fit fertilized with tomato fertilizers weekly through the growing season and guess what you can use for tomatoes uh, uh fertilizer some things you can use epsom salt epsom tomatoes love them some epsom salt what else um charcoal hmm. somebody been listening <laughs> also believe it or not echo leaves soft coffee grounds too and coffee grounds, guess what? Increase the nitrogen. Somebody told me that they can have tobacco. They use it for um, the bug repellent. It can help with bug repulsion, right? Guess what? Basil is also another good companion planter. So you can plant basil, right? With that. Growth. But it, it should have it in the controlled environment. So we don't want to overload it, but it will help in this growth process. Yeah, but we're not, we're not, with the miracle grow, the miracle grow is a slave driver. It's going to drive that plant and it's going to make it grow and it's going to become very watery. That's right. So we don't want to use a miracle grow. 
and it throws off the biology in the earth as well. Another subject, let's look at cucumbers follow the same rule, right? So they are vine growers, right? So whatever applies to the tomato, vines will apply to the cucumbers, all right? We're not gonna deal with all the different ones, but we're gonna do different ones. Okay, let's go do this one here. What type of potato is right for your garden? All right, like tomatoes, Eternal versus indeterminate potatoes uh, way of growing and knowing the difference is important depending on the length of growing season, the growing space, and uh, uh, the use of your harvest. The main difference between these two types of potatoes is what happens under the earth, on the ground. So this is the only thing you want to, this is the only time that you want to have any concept of in the closet, in the dark, you know, coming out to the open is here. Okay, forget that. Let's move on. So we have determined potatoes. Determined potatoes produce a single layer of tubers just below the surface, the soil surface, and are best for what? Shorter growing seasons. If you hope to get some of the good, a good sized tubers to store for winter. However, we're gonna take that a little further, okay? While they may produce as many potatoes as an indeterminate potato, they grow fast and form potatoes early, allowing them to grow to a good size for storage. Determined potatoes tend to have somewhat shorter plants, a determined size or less likely to flop over and do not need mounting. All right, making them a little less maintenance if you like to plant and go and don't have a lot of space in your garden. Okay, so we're gonna look at these right here. Here's some examples of, uh, of these types of potatoes. Have y'all heard of the, um, we're probably familiar with the, the Yonkin Gold, right? Yeah. What about the Red Pony at? The red ones you find in store, the dark red, uh, New Orleans, you find that in stores a lot. Um, and the Kennebec, those tend to be elongated, right? Got some pictures of those. And uh, these are determinate. Yeah, so these are determined. Is there one more officially against on this? So that's going to go back to growing environment. What's in the ground? What's in the ground? However, so remember we talked about the difference in minerals. What? How do we know that? How do we know the difference in the nutrient value of a food? We covered it earlier. How do you know the nutritional value the density, of the, the amount of weight. sugar in the food? So the sweeter the food, the more mineral. Okay. So I, I, I try to teach in a way that get concepts. A sweet potato would have more, more nutrition than one that is not, because it has more what? Sugar. All right? Okay, so let's move on. Indeterminate potatoes produce layers of potato, and plants keep growing throughout the growing season. They both produce uh, potatoes in layers, all right? Uh, Indeterminate. Mounding provides a space for layers to grow. We'll come back. They do take longer to produce tubers, but you can harvest potatoes throughout the growing season. Hmm. As they mature, 
from small early potatoes to larger ones later in the season. Hmm, what does that sound like based on what we talked about a little while ago? How about the potatoes? Oh, yeah. All season long they're growing. So you can eat tomatoes throughout the season. You can eat potatoes throughout the season. Different habits. We're going to get more into that in just a minute. Both types of potatoes do well in the garden, but indeterminate potatoes are what? Best for bag potatoes and containers in small spaces. And there's a reason why. We'll see that in a minute. Indeterminate potatoes. Um, some of the different ones here. The German butterball is now. Uh, I want that. <laughs> it's a big tubular. Okay, so let's look at here a little bit more. So, definite or defined characteristics of determinate and indeterminate potatoes. Indeterminate varieties grow their potatoes just below the soil surface, while determinate varieties grow their potatoes slightly under the soil level. So, one is what? One does what? It peaks out the earth. The other does what? Just below the soil level, slightly above the soil level. One peaks out, one hides. So when we look at these two types of potatoes, it's going to tell you how you can manipulate it and produce more potatoes. Once we understand the what? The characteristics on how they operate. So, remember we mentioned a little while ago on this one here? It says mounding provides what? Support for and space for layers to grow. Somebody's getting it. So if you, what is mounding? What is mounding? Adding dirt, and it does what? When, what are you doing? When you you you're increasing what? The space. The the the. the you're increasing the. Perfect. What do you say? The height of the mound, and when you do that, it does what? Provides space for the what? So what does that mean? As you mound, there's more room now so more potatoes can grow. You mound more, more potatoes grow. So those seeds, those leaves become roots and produce more potatoes. So this is where you get people taking tires and adding them on, more soil, higher to put another tire on and add more soil, and they have potato mounds high in the sky. And the end of the year, they kick them over and the potatoes are everywhere. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The bigger they are, the more room for what? More space for layers to grow. Indeterminate grows on the level of where the what? Those roots are. They don't go down. But when they stick to the earth, they're telling you what? They are ready to grow. They want to grow up. You'll see them. They're the kind of potatoes you got to mound up because they will stick their head above the, the soil. And if you don't cover them up, what's going to happen? They're going to they're gonna be what, green? Yeah. And we don't want to eat those, right? No. So you cover them up and then you continue to grow. As long as you give it what it needs to grow, what is it going to do? There you go. So the indeterminate do what? They grow upward. Hmm. So as long as you give provide, as long as you provide the, they will put and produce tubers. If you give it to them, because they can't get it themselves. You see that? Y'all see that? So that means by default, what do the determinant do? Time and they 
time, and that's it. Just like tubers grow on the roots that it produces from the from the leaves, the tubers on a determined grow where? On the roots. And roots go which direction? Down. Down. So it to determine it will grow down. And the reason why this is so popular because people don't want to dig down in the earth. They rather have it in a box, open the box up and take some tubers out and close it back up. Or build it up on a tire and have a whole ton of them. See, that's what we're talking about. So the determined grow down into the earth. And of course, they require you to do what? Do some digging. So if you're going to grow those and you want to have a nice harvest, instead of using a whole lot of sand, which compacts, you want to mix things into your soil. I wasn't planning to get into all this, but that's OK. You mix things with your soil to keep it nice and soft and loose. You can get both get in either, either direction. Again, based on what you have, your environment. If you have a big garden, if you have a small space, then it matters, right? So determine what you want to do determines what type you will use. So you want to get that kind, but then the, the type, determined or indeterminate. So you get the same kind of potato with a different type? Yes. How is that possible? This is how it's possible. I mean, it sound like the tomatoes <laughs> Let's say you're a gangster, okay. right? You are, you're a, um, what's your nationality? Uh, Italiano. You're Italiano gangster, the worst kind, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then you have a, and then you have a, a, say a black gangster, right? Now, now, I, you know, as a black gangster, I'm not as bad as the, those them, them Italian gangsters, man. Man, woo, they, they, New York, huh? Anyhow, so Christ with me and saved me. But guess what? But it's enough to save you too. So don't matter. It's enough for you and for me. So, so those who have a small garden, guess what? They can have it too. Mm, so that, okay, so according to the circumstances, you may use permanent. So you may not be able to get maybe say not the rustic, but a one that's like the rustic or a type of rustic in other type, and has some of the same eating qualities, etc. We mean in both. Oh, okay. Uh, and based upon your circumstance. So this one is left out. God has made a provision for everybody's situation. Right? So that way, as a black gangster, I can shake your hand for an Italian gangster. We don't be saved. We don't be doing that. We don't be saved. So we saved by the blood, right? All right. We know no, no longer. <laughs> Uh, all right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, let's move. Okay, yeah, so small space, go up. Okay, so for instance, exactly, so uh, a determinant, you may have a long row. You got the space. In determinant, grow up. You don't have the space. All right? Okay, so here's some examples. We saw that already. And uh, okay, so again, we can see, so as we mound up, Cover it with soil, those roots become, those leaves become roots. Tubers at that level, tubers at the next level, at the next level, is continue to grow. Exactly. Exactly. Because they're a different type. The indeterminate, the, the determinant, it quits. Yeah, it's, it's backwards. Yeah. Right. So they grow on different levels. They function on different levels. Right. So, um, right. So sometimes you see people take take a, a, a plant here. They dig a hole, but a trench type hole, 
then they plant that link, that, that the, the roots of one side and the, and the, and, and the, 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 uh, the stem comes over to the side and then comes up and leaves it down here. They do that so that those leaves become root systems. They have a bigger root system for the plant. It doesn't matter what kind of plant it is. Now we have the stronger root system. Well, you see that people do that with the, the tomatoes. Okay. They'll bend over to the regular root system and they develop another root system. So based on how many leaves uh, uh, levels you have will become root systems. So it would have a stronger root system. Um, you, you don't normally see that. I, I wouldn't see why they won't work. All right. Okay. So we want to look at real quickly some companion planting for beans, bush beans. Say that again. I'm not sure because remember corn is used a lot for starch as well. Of course, it has a high. I don't, I don't know. Could be. I, I'm, I didn't hear that. Got you. But again, you know, there are different uh, bugs that will attack the plant. And again, all production of any plant takes place where? In the leaf structure. Because the leaf is a chemical factory for the plants. So whatever affects the leaf affects the plant. Companion planting is an organic method of preventing infecting plants from pests and disease. Yeah, Hannah. All right. Um, uh, uh, also attract the right types of insects for pollination. They enhance the nutrient uh, content uptake and increase the, the crop production simply by growing the right plants near each other. They influence each other, right? Mm -hmm. And they influence each other um, just like, um, just like uh, Jeremy's influencing his wife and his wife is influencing him, his, his, him. You know, right now you can see them kind of squirming and doing all kinds of stuff because they influence each other, <laughs> you know? So it's the same thing with these with these plants, right? You get a male and a female together. You get a male and a female together, and things start happening, right? In essence, companion planting helps to bring a balanced ecosystem to your landscape, allowing nature to do its job. And we don't need any demonstrations of that today, right now. Okay. All right. So benefits of look at look at we want to look at eight. Benefits of companion planting. Pest control, right? Some plants can emit scents that either repel insects or attract them or confuse them or disease organisms in each of their favorite host plants. Insert, I'm sorry, insert their host plants. So they, as they're looking for these plants, it can confuse them and it makes the insects less likely to land on your garden vegetables. That's why we companion plant. Also, it attracts beneficial insects. Some plants help attract beneficial insects, such as ladybugs, bees, butterflies, that pollinate and help control harmful bugs. Beneficial insects feed on common garden pests, like aphids and caterpillars. That's right. High five. High five. High five. Okay, he's not giving me the high five. That's right. That's right. So it's, that's why it's good to know the bugs. Some of our friends, some of my folks, just like disease, right? So, you know, disease is your friend, tell you something's wrong. Bugs, which you don't like, can also tell us something's wrong. And they take care of different issues and problems, right? Okay, let's move on. Also, it provides necessary shade. 
tall, sun-loving plants offer shade to smaller ones. Loving plants, shade-loving plants. This results uh, in better production and can also potentially provide pest control. Good example is the Three Sister Garden, practiced by Native Americans for thousands of years. Corn, beans, and squash. So they work together, right? Just like beans and corn. Can I remember we talked about that? They will grow them. They they will grow and they will work together. The tall corn provides shade for the lower squash, but also stops the squash vine bore beetle. So they work together. The corn helps to provide the squash with a defense from their vine boar beetle. Do we not see that in like In what again? No. No, because it's, 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 you cannot control, it costs too much. Just like it's too much work to do hydrotherapy in hospitals. Too much work, too little return. All right, let's move on. If some commanding planting can provide wind breaks and prevent soil erosion, strong winds can damage gardens by removing mulch, topsoil, and erosion. Uh, beds and erosion beds and hillsides. Rain can also cause severe damage by beating down on young seedlings. Be careful selecting the right uh, cover crops that can help to prevent soil erosion. Also provides natural support. Some companion plants can physically support each other by uh, providing stalking. Example like corn, beans, squash together apply here. All right, move on. Space saver. You got that one? Six. Into planting different crops greatly maximizes what? Space and provides productivity in small gardens. Great benefit for small gardens. Seven. Look at this one. It enhances what? Flavors. Some plants can subtly influence the flavors of other plants. Most herbs have been found to enhance the flavor of fruits and vegetables grown nearby. As basil grown beside tomatoes is an example of that. Similarly, chamomile has an aromatic scent that is believed to improve the growth and flavor of cabbage, cucumbers, and onions when they're grown beside them. Also, it helps uh, better quality, soil quality and fertility. Some crops help nitrogen uh, from the atmosphere and reduce fertilizer needs. See that? Similarly, planting plants with different root structures together can aerate the soil and allow it to pull nutrients from different parts of the soil. So those that have a, a more shallow root system and those that have a more deeper root system, do they affect each other? No, they get everything they need and they don't compete. <clears throat> Not only can companion planting help you plant better, uh, plants grow better, but it can also make vegetables gardens more attractive thanks to the, uh, adding, uh, add, uh, uh, to the adding, G, of colorful flowers that help or hinder nearby vegetables. Companion planting combines beauty and purpose to create an enjoyable, healthy environment. So here, here on, we're just dealing with different plants and how they affect each other. Dill attracts what? Hoverflies and predatory wasps and repels aphids. Mexican bean beetles and spiders, mice to some degree. So they attract different animals and different things. This is very beneficial. I want to show this. I'm going to stop this right quickly. I want to show you all a, a video real quickly on the hoverfly. Um, I think this is very, very powerful. And um, and um, that's not the one there. And um, it's very... Um,
Uh oh. Is that, uh oh, I'm sorry. Boom. May not see it. Uh oh. Did I shut that other one down by mistake? Yep, I did. Uh oh. Sorry, guys. Nope. I, I, I think the one that I erased. Okay, but anyhow, the hoverfly. It's a very, it's a very interesting um, plant. I mean, animal. It's a, uh, and it does one of the things that it likes to do. Is it's, it's a, it's a good defense to many different bugs and lava that get on your leaves and eat your leaves up. Aphids and all that eats them up. Defense again. It's a defense and against yes. So they're very good for your garden. You want to increase the product of the environment. They're very beautiful animals. So you can take them to that, well, how, how you prepare that ground. So you want to, you, let's say you can take a, a, a pot, put water in it and put grass, dry grass in it and let it do its thing. It provides a house, a home for the breeding of them. And um, um, uh, the, the, the different things that, that we're learning, uh, one, something else that you can use for Japanese beetles is um who was it you mentioned about it or was sister you mentioned about it? Rosemary is a is a deterrent for them as well. We're gonna start doing is plant some rosemary in the garden. I mean in the orchard. And um and there's a there's a method that we're gonna also incorporate to do some mass trapping, keep them off the garden. But um also in the the rosemary is is a pungent, it has a pungent odor that they dislike. And, uh, and I'm seeing more and more as I'm looking into it that that is a, also a very good deterrent for them. Borage. Borage flowers are pretty and attractive. Uh, they attract beneficial insects and can deter pests from your beans. And guess what? They're edible. So you can grow this with your beans. Good for the nervous system. Cucumbers are great plants to plant with beans. Why? Because the two plants like the same kind of conditions. All right, and they help each other. Also, sorry about that. Drew some artich. I don't have that information there. Sorry. Catnip. Catnip attracts insects and helps to repel uh, flea beetles. A common pest found on many vegetable crops, including beans. Yep. Sweet basil is another valuable addition to the vegetable garden and can ex is excellent for companion planting of, of beans. Um, oregano enhances flavors. It also attracts, guess what? The hoverfly. And it also, and uh, pronounce that for me, please, sugar. S Y R P H I D A E. There you go. And it repels aphids. You don't have that one in the radish. Now, uh, it's to deter what deer. It's interesting. Fleas, beetles, the flea beetles, red spider mites, and cutworms. Where do we find cutworms? They eat up your leaves, right? Oh, really? Rhubarb. Rhubarb protects beans against the black fly. Rosemary repels insects. And it's a good deterrent for carrot flies, beetles, carrot moths, and now I need to put up the, uh, the, the, the Japanese beetle. Summer savoy improves the growth and flavor of beans and deters bean beetles. Good attracting to honeybees as well. Eggplant grows among green beans to protect them from what? The Colorado potato beetle. Since it repels uh, beetles, uh, Find a B. Okay. In addition, helps to eggplant receives enough uh, nutrients by fixing nitrogen and increasing nutrients in the soil. Corn it helps what? The nitrogen, right? And in addition, pole beans may be planted with corn to climb their stalks. Maybe we talk about that already. So beans and, and corn help to work together. Yes. Like 
I don't know which one. Is that the Santa? I don't know. Okay. Well, I think it was the Santa, but it had like tons of money. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. All right, peach. Peach trees, apricot, peach, and nectarine do better with nitrogen-fixed plants like beans at the base of the tree. Isn't that something? Marigolds help to repel the Mexican beetle, bean beetle. Mm -hmm. And marigolds are, are edible, right? I think. This is another edible one. All the varieties of this, uh, of this one here are all edible. And this one deters the bean beetle pest. Petunas um, repels garden pests such as tomato worms, beetles, uh, Mexican bean, the aphids, leaf hoppers, and a, a, a asparagus beetle. Yes. Green? Yes. That's the hornworm. Yeah, eat it. Yeah, he will eat it. He'll eat it very quickly. Sure will. Okay, so these here are the best and worst plants for pole beans. We were looking at bush beans. This is pole beans. Onions are the best companion plants in your garden. Their smell protects against pests, and their compact size allows them to be interplanted where there's room. Onions deter aphids, fleas, beetles, spider mites, and cut worms. Also, they're good for all these things right here. Also, um, onions, uh, planter near carrot, plants near carrots help repel uh, the carrot fly, discourage rabbits from eating them and, and, and eating the cabbage and lettuce plants. Look at that. It's phenomenal. I'm not going to read all that. And here again, there's some other things that's beneficial. Do not plant onions near asparagus, beans, peas, or sage. Because why? Because onion can stunt the growth of these crops and negatively affect their flavor. So there's do's and there's don'ts, right? Best and better. Garlic, powerful, strong scent. It's a repellent, has repellent properties. It's a natural antifungal, right? Drives away pests from the available crops, but it attracts insects for pollination. Hmm? Repels mosquitoes. It's a natural insecticide. Keep it away your dog, from your dogs. Keep it away from your dogs. See that? Keep it away from your dogs. Keep it away from your cats and your horses. They're toxic to them. Same thing with ch ch uh, trees, chives, onion, chives, and garlic. Same thing. Attracts bees and butterflies. Say it again. No. <coughs> this is a type of lettuce. It's a cousin to wormwood with a scent that is unique. It's a weapon against mosquitoes and other insect pests. See if you can get some of that. Beets, can you believe it? Garlic improves the flavor of beets and catnip uh, helps it to grow. But you don't want to plant around pole beans and field mustard. Radish, onion, carrots deter aphids, fleas, uh, beetles, red spiders, mites, and cut worms. Cabbage, these things that grow well around cabbage. Borage helps to deter the tomato what? That's what we talked about. Cabbage worms and is also one of the best plants for attracting bees and wasps. So uh, these here, this is where around the cabbage. That's right, every one of them. And they're repelling, they're repelling, repelling, bringing in good uh, uh, beneficial plants, and, I mean, insects and bugs and getting rid of repelling the others. Here's the hoverfly. 
Adult hoverflies feed on flower nectar and it helps to pollinate some crops. But it is the larva that are important predators in the garden. It goes after the larva, the tiny, nearly invisible slug-like larva that scores the underside of plant leaves uh, and, uh, and for aphids and eat them as their primary food source. So having the habitat for hoverflies is important. Hoverflies are the number one most useful natural enemies for plant pests. So you want them around. And so we're going to make sure and have them this year by God's grace, even you know, regardless. Some species, look at this, have been estimated to eat up to what? 1,200 aphids during the larva stage. One study, uh, the diminutive um, chevron hoverfly was found to exert from 70 to 100% control of aphids. Isn't that powerful? No, they, they, there's nothing in the house they want. There's nothing in the house they want. <laughs> so they'll stay outside. Here's some more, here's some more, here's more, here's more. Tansy deters cabbage worms, cut worms. Time deters cabbage worms. You didn't get this one. You didn't get that one. You got that one. You didn't get this one. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. That one. Okay. Do not plant near what? Corn, pepper, whole beans, row, strawberries, or tomatoes. Broccoli. Those are benefits. Beneficial ones. Those two. Those two. Those two. <laughs> Do not plant broccoli near tomatoes, peppers, pole beans, rural pasta, mustard, mustard. Remember those those two together. It's very similar. Peppers. Yep. There's a, oh, oh, talking about that. I'm glad you said that. And I'll say this. When you start looking at peppers, peppers fall into three categories. And you see the number three always coming up. The number three is always coming up. It's a significant biblical number. So when we start looking at uh, peppers, they fall into three categories. We have what we all are familiar with, uh, which is known as the, um, the uh, pimento. Pimento peppers. Pimento peppers have a zero heat rating, so there's no heat at all. We use it for different things like coloring foods and adding flavor. And then we have what we call red pepper. Red pepper is the second category of your peppers. And red pepper rates from one, heat rating of one, all the way up to a heat rating of 40. And then from 40 and above, all the way up is what is the category of cayenne. And so you have the three categories. You have the uh, paprika, you have the red pepper, and you have uh, cayenne. So those are the three categories of where peppers fall into. Heat rating zero from 1 to 40, 49 all the way up. And then in that cayenne category is where we'll find the medicinal cayennes the medicinal red pepper. And that's going to be from 90,000 on up. Okay? Some other benefits, uh, companion planting. There are others. There are others there. There are more. There's a lot in here. And more. And more. Some plants do not make good companions for peppers, either do uh, competing sources. Some plants do not. Right. Okay. Yeah. These are bad companions. Sorry. 
Four pepper, correct. You got that one already. You got that one already. You got that one. This one you may not have forgotten. Strawberries can be bad companion plants for peppers as they attract what? Mm -hmm. Which can damage both plants. They also compete for space and nutrients in the soil. Good herbs, pepper, uh, the good herbs for peppers. Pepper, in the middle, they repel harmful insects such as spiders, mites, and a Japanese beetle. So we need to plant some of that around our trees too. Fennel, this is the last one we have on fennel, oh, this is the last herb we deal with fennel. And he's a, here's, uh, continuing to get down to fennel is one of the few plants that has most bad companions. Most plants dislike fennel. Fennel, uh, and it should be planted well away from vegetable gardens. Fennel inhibits the growth of any nearby plant, including kohlrabi, bush beans, caraway, and tomatoes. Kohlrabi is a green. It has a big bulb and produces a lot of greens. Yeah. Also, fennel inhibits in inhi fennel inhibited by the presence of coriander and will not form seeds. So, so that's important. Fennel also dislikes wormwood. That's from before. This, this is, you already took this one. You didn't take it, I just went back up one. Um, it's mistaken for dill sometimes. All right, and that's it. So I hope that um, this has been beneficial as you look at uh, choosing the types of plants that you would need. Of course, there's many other plants. These, I think, are more specific because they have different characteristics. They perform differently. And they also, the size of your garden, uh, to a great degree, may limit you to one or the other. Not necessarily to, to the other, but at least to one. So you, you can, get again, get the maximum uh, out of you uh, that you can. Uh, other plants, um, not that, that that other plants don't have um, um, uh, bad or good, but again, covered a lot in here. So it covers a lot of other types of plants that you um, that you're planting, and uh, but these in particular um, can impact. You know, putting putting one down can really impact the the amount of produce you can harvest, and especially as we're moving to time when we need to start preparing for ourselves and being able to provide the maximum amount of food. You want to be able to make in inform the decisions to you know to get the maximum and the best production of your foods you could do you know again you can do whatever you want at the same time you can make informed decisions based upon what you want and that's um as far as what we can what things you would want to plant and then of course there are other things many other types of foods that can be done as long as you provide the proper environment and again, with all these foods, you want to learn how to save seed. You want to know how to uh, make sure that you can get the pure seed, maintain the pure seed, so you can have the foods that continue to grow over and over and over. And of course, you want to plant them in different areas of your garden so you can get, you know, as nutrients are being utilized in one area, they can be moved. Because every time you, you plants take, it's also going to put out. So you learn the different areas of rotation, crop rotation. Yes. Tomatoes. tomatoes and eggplants we i think we looked at the here just a minute ago uh, i think that was particularly under the eggplants okay so this particular one here i think it i think this one talks about it i think um no it doesn't mention this one so if there if this if it's not a um if it's not showing a uh a, 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 a problem then you should be okay with it but um, I think this is a very exhaustive cost. Some areas I didn't, I haven't been able to get those in yet. But um, this is a, it, it's a very large bank of information as far as things you can and cannot plan around. Yeah, more, they, I'm sure there is. But um, but better 
plan where we're going to put things in our garden again to get the maximum so we don't have issues with bugs here and you know wait a minute, wait, if i swap this over here then this will i won't get these bugs over here because that would you know what i'm saying and it can really help and of course of course you want to plan these things and what we want to do also is as you, as you plan your your crops what i would advise is to, you know you say you you plan one crop I mean, you, 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 yeah, you plan one crop of how you want to set up your garden, and as soon as possible, set up another planting system with its rotation. And then when you're able to, a third one of rotation. Why do I say that? Because this year you plant this way. Next year you plant the other way. The following year you plant the other way, and then you rotate between those three. So you're planting things in different places of the earth and soil, so you're not robbing and 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 um, exhausting the, the minerals in the earth in the soil, but this way you can give and take here, rotate, give and take, or something else comes and gives and takes, and you're constantly putting back and taking out, putting back and taking out, so you're getting good crop rotation to maintain the health and balance of your soil, right? And so by having it already pre-planned, when the time for planting comes, you already have it in place, you already know what to do. And you don't have to go back to the drawing board. And of course, any time that we plan, no, when we don't plan, what do we do? We plan to fail. So by God's grace, we can do our part. And this is, I feel, it's a very important part of um, planting and producing your garden. Because if you don't plant your things well, then it's a cost. And we all have a learning curve. But we have the years to go by a um, it's a vast amount of inflation, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, it gives you so that you can move forward and get the most fruit production. Amen. So, I pray this has been helpful. And um, we have a word of prayer, we can close. We thank you for the opportunity we've been able to look at these things and be able to get a better grasp on uh, categories and the different types of foods. We can get a better understanding of what we should plant, the types of plants in these different categories to give us the maximum and the best. And also how, how we can partner our plants up with other plants. Guide us and keep us as we read these preparations, Lord. We ask you to guide us. And as we seek to uh, uh, make, make the so that as we are making our way through this world, which is not our home, we can have better success less faith and less things to hold us down and hold us back in this warfare of life so be with us and again thank you for good success as we seek to obey the injunction that we need to prepare for the emergency that we will meet thank you in christ's name amen, amen. amen. Hello? Ooh. Hello. Okay, that's really hot. That concludes Advent 8, 2024. Until next year, God bless you.